Hello, Baker Advanced Financial Planning students. So we are now entering week six. And uh, for week six, you have chapters 16, 17, and 18, the forum discussion, and the quiz. And just uh, keep plugging along because you're going to um, have the PowerPoint presentation doing the last week. You get a little bit of break from the forum discussion next week. And of course, if you're watching this on Sunday, I'm going to do a Zoom, just kind of voluntary. If people want to join, uh, I'd love to meet you too, kind of, um, at least virtually. I know a lot of it's been online. I've, I've had you in past courses. So I wanted to open up at least this one opportunity. So if you can come, great. If you can't, I, I totally understand. So anyway, with uh, this week with Chapter 16, the first one with bonds, um, you, you've been exposed to this before with uh, uh, finance classes and kind of understanding the relationships to changes in interest rates and yield to maturity and understanding the inverse relationship with bonds that when rates go up, the present value of those bonds goes down. So that's one you know risk actually investing in bonds based on what we call mark to market is that you could potentially lose money in bonds, even though it pays a guaranteed interest rate uh, because uh, things are always changing, either demand for stocks or demand for bonds. Um, the price uh, as if you were to sell it in the market. That's why I say it's just kind of based on that. And that's what bond mutual funds do too, is they look at the value of those bonds as if they could sell them today, even if they're, they're not selling it. So you could actually invest in a bond mutual fund and lose money. I, I have some uh, bond mutual funds through my Fidelity retirement account. One's like an investment grade, another one's a corporate bond fund. But there are ways, you know, um, which we'll talk about mutual funds in a little bit. But it's. Um, it's a common portfolio strategy, and even within mutual funds, even though some are stocks, like a balanced fund, there are many bonds. And I will tell you that bonds are much more prevalent than stocks as ways that companies raise capital. It's just not as sexy as you will. So we don't hear a bit much as about it, but it's still, uh, there, there's major big market players in it, and uh, there's bond portfolio traders, so it's, uh, it's still a big part of the market. So, and right now, especially, you know, with the uncertainty with COVID-19, you think about a lot of the corporate bonds, uh, the risk involved in those, uh, because, you know, uh, that's kind of operating bit risk or business risk, you know, will they default on those bonds? So, uh, it's, it's part of that risk, as we kind of said before, that, you know, they can reach a junk level status where they're, they're downgraded below a certain level by Moody's or S&P. So... Why would we want to have bonds in a portfolio? Obviously, it's a way to kind of uh, be a little bit more conservative to preserve, you know, some of the uh, portfolio. Also, have different strategies. You know that uh, they met the textbook mentioned about interest rate changes to try to predict those. What was going to happen? Um, you know, you could hold for a long period of time. It's almost like a CD ladder. You can build up. Um, you know, short period, um, like a one year, two year, three year, five, ten, twenty year bonds. Uh, obviously, those that have long maturities have interest rates. Now, interest rates are so low right now, too. So it's um, it's a little bit of a challenge to try to find a bond with a really good rate. Um, it's actually a risk. You, you'd end up, like, say, you bought a 30-year bond, corporate bond that was at 4%. What if interest rates go up? Now, we, we've had a long period here since the subprime crisis of very low interest rates. We, we thought we were getting better, and then all of a sudden when COVID hit, uh, it kind of reversed. But... But uh, essentially, you know, another strategy is just matching the needs. So um, trying to figure out when, when do you want these bonds to pay interest or mature so that you would have that money available to you. Uh, mutual funds, we probably own, all own mutual funds in some way, directly or indirectly through our um, company or institutional uh, retirement plans. Um, it's, you know, I have, I have friends that work in the industry. I have a friend, she works in American Century. Uh, her job is solely to just make sure she works with the legal department that says that whatever the uh, investment side is buying is truly holding to what the prospectus says of the mutual fund. And I remember when I uh, started the finance business back in the, the late 80s and compared to today, the the amount of mutual funds that are out there is almost dizzy. It's just, you know, it was, uh, you know, it's, they started a long time ago. I think the first one may have originated out of Boston. But... Um, yeah, I often wondered, I, I had a friend that I worked with uh, years ago, and we, we thought that um, it was a, at a major credit union whether we could should go out and start our own mutual fund. But it seemed like a very attractive idea at, at that time, so there's a lot involved in it. Uh, but um, anyway, 
Well, there's so many choices out there, and that's what you have to be cautious with as an investor, or or if you were helping someone make those choices. You know, the difference in understanding the fees, uh, difference between load and no load. And I was always taught in graduate school that uh, the research that they're really, you know, the returns compared to a load fund versus a no load fund, there really wasn't any significant difference. You know, so it, it almost behooves you to go with the no load funds uh, unless you just really feel that that. Uh, load fund is doing so much better, but again, if you believe in efficient market hypothesis, you know it's it's just kind of like paying more money for fees that you don't need to, and that that's where I think we've also seen a big change in the years too. Is helping consumers. That was part of the Consumer Financial Protection uh, Agency is to really uh, I think they call it a fiduciary interest. You know, did consumers really understand? You know, now you see this, we get these statements from your retirement about how much, you know, the, the fees were for that time period because of these rule changes. So investors know, you know, so how much of these fees just eating away at your retirement or other types of investments. So people understand that when they're making the choices. But some of the things you'll read about, kind of refresher, you know, the net asset value. Uh, the big, big one in recent years has been the ETFs. Exchange traded funds have gained a lot of popularity. I, I personally don't have any, but uh, something that I, I'm interested in, you know, it gives kind of the benefits they mentioned, uh, especially with the tax benefits that, uh, you know, mutual funds, they, they have to declare, you know, uh, capital gain or taxes you have to, for tax purposes. But uh, if you were hold on the ETF until you sell the ETF, you would not have that uh, capital gain or loss. So that can be a benefit. And you could do some other features with it too. Uh, like, you know, uh, play options on them, stop loss, all those things because they're traded. You can trade it at any time during the day, too. So it's uh, just a little bit more easier, I'd say, uh, transactional uh, to be able to invest in those types of uh, ETFs. So. But as with uh, any types of, you know, mutual funds or any types, you know, things that you're buying, you know, there, there's all kinds of different funds out there, sector funds, technology funds, balance funds. But it goes back to the risk return trade off. So, uh, obviously, um, you have to be wise about this. You have to, you know, Morningstar does reviews on uh, funds and you know, their performance. You know, I always kind of like to see funds that the managers have been there a, a long period of time. That's not so new. Uh, you kind of get an idea. But even though past performance doesn't guarantee future performance, but nice thing if you look at mutual funds, you kind of see the breakdown of their uh, major holdings too, you know, and how, how has the fund performed? over different periods of time and what is your objective. So uh, again, you know me, I'm, I'm always a big fan of the SP 500 index fund. It's low cost, most prof professionals have a hard time beating it. So it's kind of a great way to diversify uh, and keep it at a very low cost. Um, so the last one with chapter 18, you know, just kind of talks about asset allocation, um, you know, diversifying your portfolio. You know, the old adage, no, keep all your eggs in one basket. Uh, you try to want to try to have different types of uh, funds that offset each other, or funds, I should say, funds, investments, stocks, whatever it would be. So they're not like perfectly correlated. You you want something that you know if you you know we we talk about systemic risk and unsystemic risk. Um, you know, in terms of right right now, you know, like it's really amazing to me that the market how well it's doing, uh, even with all these concerns about recession and COVID. So people are optimistic to some degree, but there's certain risk you cannot there's diversify away. You know, if the economy is not doing well and COVID-19 is around a long time, you just can't protect against that. You can put in something cash, you know, but there's an opportunity to lost. But you can diversify away company-specific risk, and that, that's investing in different types of companies or different types of investments uh, to help help offset. You know, after the subprime crisis, there was a lot of people, especially their retirement portfolios, um, some people had lost like half their money you know so you, you think about those that are ready for retirement you know so um you know but that important uh, diversifying eventually that that came back you know it was 10 years later but that time it was very hard and uh even chapter 18 talks about real estate options REITs, uh the use of options you know try to protect your portfolio if you you felt that there was a major change that could be something you could do um i thought it was interesting too you know just talking about the uh, retirement uh, you know one of the, the rules of thumb uh, I don't know if this holds so much anymore, but it was like a, you take age 100, um, then however old you were, if you were 60, then at age 60, you should only have 40% of your uh, money in stocks or equities. 
but you know now people are living longer so that might be 110 or 120 and then subtracting your age but it really just comes down to your risk tolerance you know and what what do you need like during retirement to make sure you preserve that capital um, because you have, you're going to have certain expenses so you want to kind of be able to take advantage of gains but you don't want to be in a situation where um, you, you had your house and now you got to sell your house and live a lower standard of living in retirement so it's um, it has to be some balance there so well anyway that's everything for this week so if you do have any questions do email me I'll try to get back to you that day or the following day but again, i um, hoping some people get to come tomorrow night in the Zoom session. Uh, we'll just got to see what happens. I'm just going to do it for an hour. People come and jump in and out as they need to. Um, but if you have any questions there, I'll try to answer those questions too. So take care and have a great week.